I am actually just going to give it uh, five, ten minutes just to make sure everyone's arrived. And Society, and today we're welcoming a very special guest, which is Philip. He's come all the way from Switzerland, and he's going to put forward a case for the material improvements in decentralized finances and the promises that it can deliver. So he's going to present debt financing um, of renewable energy in Africa as the ideal place where technology has the largest ability to deliver material socioeconomic benefits. Um, so 
Philip has actually studied for a PhD in quantitative finance and is the founder of Frig, which is a software as a service company which provides technology to upscale sustainable project development. Um, most sustainable projects are not actually realized, and to fix this, Philip uh, argues that we need to fix the cause and not the symptoms. So, with that, I'll um, see. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It was so good. Yeah, I don't mean to speak, I can go home back to Switzerland. I think it wasn't worth it. Uh, but hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I've said it many times before, and I will say it many times uh, to come as well. Being here, I sort of get the sense that you can feel the brain power among the, the student society here. So it's really a great pleasure to be here and be able to share some of the research uh, that I'm doing at the university um, and also a startup uh, that I founded with my professor, a PhD supervisor uh, at the university in uh, the Department of Banking and Finance, and also a great colleague of mine who has uh, 20 years skilled DevOps engineer. And the topic uh, to be discussed today is sort of how to make sustainable finance accessible, efficient, and transparent. And I, before I, I got here today, I watched the presentation of uh, Professor Sir Chris uh, Smith at, um, last week. Um, that sort of created an excellent foundation for the presentation today. Uh, last time, if you watched it, it was very much focusing on how to that frame the future energy needs and how they can be met sustainably on more from a theoretical angle. And the focus on the presentation today and what I'm hoping to bring along is sort of more practical approach to the command. And through the years of being a researcher, but also uh, in, in practice, and particularly on the development side of sustainable infrastructure projects, um, we've uncovered sort of two main barriers, and unsurprisingly to many of you in the room and, and joining virtually, they relate to two major obstacles, and those are screening barriers and financial barriers. And obviously, sustainable infrastructure is key to address this climate change. Now, the first topic is a topic in itself, uh, but what I mean here is relating to really the very lengthy process of analyzing infrastructure projects. So, sort of uh, an example here is hydropower projects that require a very, very lengthy process to do the due diligence. That is, for the most part, very costly because it's very fragmented. So, the developers they acquire third party services from different providers. Um, for hydropower in particular, that could be from someone doing the hydrology analysis, someone doing the environmental feasibility analysis, and this all creates friction. But as said, that's a topic for another day. Uh, what I will be focusing on is really the financial barriers that the same projects are facing. And if we take a look at, um, step back and look at the history associated with financing these types of projects, you can see on the very left side, on the slide here, how it had been done uh, in the very early days. And the way they did it was actually that it was governmentally funded through a utility. So think here of, again, um, renewable energy as a power source. The utility has an interest, a uh, vested interest in developing, developing it um, as a result of demand in uh, the region that they operate. The utility then acquired funding from the government uh, and also debt facilities uh, globally, be it development banks uh, or even international funding institutions. From there, uh, the process is uh, creating a special purpose vehicle that basically is the project itself. Now, this was uh, by, by a long time a very sustainable model to finance these kind of projects, but quickly shifted because um, it was uh, neglecting some of the fundamental um, issues of sustainability and how to promote these kind of projects. And from there onwards, in 1990, more complex financing systems uh, were set in place to um, ensure proper governance. Um, and those are called uh, private public partnerships, where you can have um, <coughs> equity side of the social purpose equals both private equity providers, that could be uh, people in the room or online, uh, with very deep pockets, bear in mind, uh, and also government facilities by the 
Again, here, debt facilities um, from multiple commercial and development banks, as well as also guarantors um, securing uh, the payment of the debt, for example, from the SPD out to the debt holders. Um, and the normal process, as you, as you all know, uh, the revenue is secured through um, an audit agreement with the utility in that particular region. The developers, however, is still um, needs to be, be done, and that's done by what is called EDC, so an engineering procurement and construction company. And these issues that they face is what I will be focusing on in this, in this talk. And naturally, as you can assume, this kind of complex financing system looks very solid and rigid, but it does also create friction. And again, if we go back to um, looking at the history uh, of hydropower capacity growth, and each line here shows a five-year increment uh, on the additional installed capacity that has been added from 1976 all the way up to 2020. And obviously, this looks promising. So it's each uh, five-year period, there is a growth in installed capacity for crucial hydropower um, plants that we need globally. However, if you put that into context and look at what is needed uh, when it comes to the climate goals that we have, so the target for 2030 uh, is around 2,200 uh, gigawatts of its whole capacity. When you take into account the current capacity and what is going to be added of new, and then subtract whatever is part of retirement, we end up uh, with a huge gap um, compared to work issue. And this is somewhat caused by the multiple layers of, uh, we call it too many hands in the cookie jar problem. So the SPV that I was mentioning before, so the special purpose vehicle holding the project itself, needs to go through several layers of third-party service providers before it actually gets funded. And that creates friction, that creates costs, and all the way up to actually the projects not even being realized. So as you can see here, the investors that are provisioning the cash, they only do it after all these service providers have done their diligence and done their service provision, and then uh, the cash and the investment flows to the originators and then the developers that are developing the assets. And this is problematic. Um, so there's too many hands in the cookie jar, for sure, uh, and this guy might not have a problem with it. I myself used to be in banking, um, and obviously, seeing it from the inside, there are a lot of issues against to be realized. And why is this a climate problem? Because finance, in a sense, well, why is it a climate <clears throat> As you can imagine, the system that I showed you before had friction and had cost. So it basically accelerates the um, cost of capital to the design of which in turn leads to a lower investment amount into these projects. That in turn leads to more pollution and eventually worsening the climate change circle. And this is what we call the climate investment trend. Now, if we look at history on the weighted average cost of capital for crucial sustainable infrastructure projects, you can see the solid line wiggling around in the trend that is upward facing. And academics and industrialists alike, they expect this trend to just continue. Now, if we will end up with the cost of capital, my eyes are basically not as great as they were at 30%, that's very problematic. Because essentially these are infrastructure projects that are not 10x return as, um, as somewhat seen in other markets. And this is the problem that we want to change because if that's not solved, we are on a way off towards plus 2.6 degrees since pre-industrial levels and way, way, way off the targets that we're supposed to. So now, imagine again the SPD that I was talking about before, and this is the way it's to all the state of <coughs> Springs Island. Um, and narrowing it is immensely difficult. 
So you have stakeholders in this ecosystem that, for one, have different economic aim goals, and others that have more social and environmental aim goals. The utility, sort of off taker paying for the electricity, for example, they have constraints and might regulate them in the off take agreement. Environmentalists, for sure. So in Switzerland, for example, uh, there are groups that don't want to build solar panels on some of the beautiful Alps that we have there, understandable. But in the end, somewhere the source needs to be um, provisioned. Equity shareholders providing the equity funding for the project might also have their constraints. <coughs> Depending on the region, they might have an expected return on investment that is higher or lower. The same for debt and guarantee providers, so taking into account the overall risk of the public. And the EPC subsequently building <coughs> the fund itself also have their requirements. And then lastly, there is the host government that also puts constraints. And all these constraints, they fall on the project entity itself. So the SPV that I showed you before, all the boundaries there defined by each of these stakeholders will decide whether or not the SPV or the project is realized. And now currently, this might be a bit stylist image, but that's the current situation. So they're not overlapping at all, implicitly meaning projects not being realized. So what we want to do is basically narrowing these stakeholders and getting them to agree on a common ground. And what we do propose is actually looking at the financial system as the key driver of the inefficiencies for these kind of uh, systems. And if we compare it with an alternative financial system, <coughs> decentralized finance, there are numerous efficiency gains to be made. So if we look at the traditional finance, so the current system, you have the assets or the SPVs that needs to go through banks, funds, and then eventually reach the money that they can acquire from investors. That accumulates transaction fees and management fees and transaction fees and implications on the return will be um, quite dramatic. If you look at decentralized finance as a comparison, you're basically replacing the financial engine that supports funding for the project with a decentralized system that is governed by code. Cheaper, much more efficient, and as the slide saying, moving from high cost to low cost, so simply transactions fees charged by the decentralized system. It's no longer restricted. So here, obviously, there are regulatory boundaries that are set in the restrictions for who can invest. But in the traditional system, and I don't know how many of you hold ownership or indirect ownership of a renewable energy fund, <coughs> I for sure don't. Um, Lucky for you if you do. I think I think more should be able to. From centralized to decentralized, that has to do also with risk and security. So as you saw <coughs> when the war broke out in Ukraine, um, they actually also moved from a more centralized to a decentralized financial system to uphold the financial so fragile to robust, inefficient to efficient transaction funds. And lastly, but more importantly, the liquidity. And the liquidity is such an important issue that researchers argued. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um. <coughs> oh, yeah, sure. Uh. So basically, the liquidity premium here is a very important factor as to why the cost of capital is increasing so much. Is it working? 
and then trying to really just share this function. As I said, the liquidity premium is an important one here, and I mentioned it briefly. So, the investment threshold for entering into SPVs or project level investments is very high, and that's natural because as a developer, you don't want to have millions of counterparties and managing that process. So, that adds to the liquidity premium since you don't have the, uh, the accessibility. And also for investors that do have accessibility, they need an option to offsell their ownership in the future. And this is what the academics looked into and tried to quantify this. So what is the illiquidity premium that is charged by investors in this case? And what you can do is actually look at it as a real option. So the option of not being able to sell the ownership of your asset, of the security for a period of time. And the graph uh, distinguishes between the different layers of volatility and the development of the ownership of the security and the length of the journey. And actually, over time, the inability to exit your position adds to the liquidity. And if we go all the way up to five years, the liquidity premium for well, more volatile assets can be up to 65%. And um, actually, infrastructure projects aren't that volatile. So you can safely assume that it's somewhere below that. But still, the holding period for infrastructure assets is longer than five years. So the issue <coughs> here is immense. So the way you can think about decentralized finance adding value here and approaching it from a different angle is comparing it to uh, an IPO. Uh, so sadly, the colors aren't showing here, uh, but the numbers are, so that's great. Um, so if we compare, and this was a, a study done by PDC, if we compare the traditional finance equivalent of an IPO, basically accessing liquidity through a stock exchange, the process of going through it is very costly. For example, for a deal, it's deal size between 25 and 100 million, so the project is, has that capex. Traditional financial industry will charge up to 22 percent of that deal to go through that process. Decentralized finance, in comparison, will charge 4.7 percent. So clearly, decentralized finance can add significant value to processing financial flows from investors to projects. And in order to substantiate this, we are taking sort of a research angle to empower them. And what we did, and was mentioned in the introduction, we are tokenizing the senior debt of an SPD that is operational in Rwanda. And I would love to show you the technology afterwards, but here is just a summary of basically what we have done. So it goes from a series loan with a fixed annual amortization uh, and an 8% annual interest. Predefined repayment schedule, obviously not in period for the loss holding the debt, to a decentralized ecosystem that can be classified like this. So, more graphically, then, uh, what we're doing to actually go through this, we had to set up our own startup <laughs> because this isn't done. Um, and what we then did is to found a startup that's called uh, Free.Eco that specializes in exactly this. So attaining decentralized finance liquidity to sustainable infrastructure assets. And this is an example that I will show you uh, by afterwards. And maybe a question to the room, how many of you hold a wallet? Show of hands. Okay, great. It's 20%, 30% of the room. That's already great. Um, so that's, that's sort of the threshold that we're faced with. Obviously, it's still very early days to decentralized finance, but the goal here is to make these investments accessible to all. And thanks to new regulation and 
actually also here in, uh, in the UK. Congratulations on the new prime minister. He seems or apparently is a crypto dude. So <laughs> that could speak to the benefit of the future of decentralized finance here as well. Um, but the regulatory framework in Switzerland is very advantageous in this respect, which has allowed us to basically sell these tokenized ownership of debt to the broader public. And before going to the last slide, I would like to shift um, to uh, the web application that we built um, and show you how it how it works. So uh, let me share the screen. <coughs> Once joining virtually, we'll all be able to see it. Uh, all right. Can I see it? Awesome. Uh, so the web app we uh, developed is called Crypto Depot. So together with my professor and uh, the developers in here, we are now a team of six people. Um, they are pushing this product. We went live two weeks ago, um, and I've already on ramp the first product, which is digital green bond backed by an operational high trust in the one. And the way it works is, so we have our own uh, web application where you can um, <coughs> see an intro movie that probably explains the matter much better than I do. Uh, we also have a, an extensive white paper that goes into the really, really detail of things. Uh, but the cornerstone of uh, the web application can be found under the universe itself. And under the universe, um, the user will be faced with Hopefully, with time, thousands of projects that have been made accessible to the broader investment community. <coughs> uh, we have one here that is live. So it's um, it's called Paratoka. It's a hydropower plant to run on the river. Um, that has been operational for the past two years. It's avoided around 2,200 tons of CO2. Um, it's a security that offers 4% interest each year. And <coughs> A user, so someone that has an interest in sustainability, wants to become an impact investor, and wants to know exactly where the money is going, <coughs> he or she can enter the page itself, whereby more details will be provided uh, about the project. So there will be an executive summary uh, on the bond, there will be um, some KPIs related to the bond with an investment target of 3 million, so the size of this bond is 3 million. What has been provided so far is around 160k, um, which within two weeks isn't bad, but still we would like to uh, see that move quicker. Um, there is obviously, as it is on the blockchain, full transparency on the transaction history. So, which wallet addresses that have been purchased in the bond? Oh. Very sensitive. I'm used to using Mac. So. <laughs> Uh, a location uh, where it is, and for those of you, for those hydropower freaks of you, you actually see the waterway here. So through the woods here, you see the waterway, and that little square there is the hydropower plant itself, so the powerhouse. And for those of you uh, who are really want to make sure that it is the power plant there, there is also access to the webcam key uh, that is there. So this isn't live yet, uh, so we have had to develop a deep neural network to scrape out people in the image. And that will become apparent uh, in the third and this is from the intake and also from the powerhouse. So for the last two weeks, nobody has been sitting here. <coughs> That's certainly not the case. Uh, there has been uh, uh, no, no there. Uh, there is also, um, however, what is live, and track real time is the uh, historic electricity production. And that's naturally used also to calculate the avoidance. Um, so the complete history is shown here. Uh, it's updated each single minute um, and gives the user full transparency on the production side and implicitly also the revenue side. There's also further detail on the backgrounds, environmental benefits. Um, and our calculation methodology. And for those that um, are concerned about the carbon footprint of the blockchain, we've also accounted for this. So it's actually real time calculating the carbon footprint of the smart contract, and you will see the net 
benefit uh, of what you see. So what I wanted to show you is actually how easy it is um, to dedicate funds towards such a digital green bond. <coughs> However, you need to possess a wallet. If you do, you simply <coughs> press buy, connect to your wallet. And that window that you saw before um, guides the user through uh, an anti mana laundering test. Um, and that's the case if <coughs> the wallet hasn't been wiped. So that process for a user takes around two minutes to complete. Uh, for businesses, it's a bit of a lengthier process, uh, but it is all documented in that. But once the user passes it, he or she will be faced with this widget where you can enter in the amount. So this is uh, using USDC, so dollar backed stable coins, to purchase the ADT, so the Agatoga tokens. And what you need to do is just go through the steps, confirm the purchase in the wallet, and it will take some time to load. And the internet connection isn't that great. This is where I'm going to my top attention in the engine line. <laughs> So naturally, you would have to yield quite an uh, extreme performance to, <laughs> to wipe out my transaction costs, um, but the principle is, is the same. Oh my goodness, it's very slow. Uh, but you, you get it, you get, uh, you get the gist. Um, let's see. Ah, oh, there we go. So the buy is pending, you can also view it on ETHF scan. Um, now we'll probably process it twice. So the transaction went through, um, and you can also view it here. <coughs> 20 seconds ago, uh, and it will also be displayed on the microsite itself uh, in the transaction history table. So it refreshes every minute, um, but then it will enter in as the last, last entry and uh, over there. 26th, so that's the transaction I've just gone through. Um, and, and that's basically it. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. And I would love to take questions if you, if you have any. Um, and thank you all for listening. Yeah, um, thank you so much, everyone, and to everyone watching online as well. Uh, if you do have questions, put them in the chat box or wait for in person, raise your hand. Um, we'll have pizza in about 15, 20 minutes ish. And um, yeah, questions and then networking and chatting. You mentioned that you incorporate the carbon footprint of the blockchain. How do you go about it overall? <coughs> 
Yeah, so there we actually use a third party software provider and they're called patch.io and they have an extensive methodology on how they do it. But in essence, they basically use the um, where the electricity is produced to maintain uh, the interior <coughs> in this case and use that as a proxy to calculate the carbon footprint. Uh, because it's obviously a mix between renewables and non-renewables, and that's the, uh, the number that I showed. And then I'm going to ask a follow-up question. What was the rationale behind choosing Ethereum as the other So it's uh, one of the reasons is uh, we believe it's to be the chain to survive uh, the next couple of years. Um, decentralized finance is in constant evolution. <coughs> Ethereum is one of the largest uh, blockchains to build decentralized apps on. Uh, so that, that was one. The second one was that once we were building the technology, we had a strong belief that it will move uh, from the world to the state, which it did, uh, reducing the energy consumption, which again, uh, talking about sustainability also means it use a sustainable uh, blockchain as well. So you said it has a on ramp of three million. Um, so how does that work in terms of everything else? Like in terms of the earth and will like not grow until three million targets would make matter if it doesn't meet the target, what happens? Okay, excellent question. So if it doesn't meet the target, it doesn't really matter for this project in particular, because that was still run. So um, the only implication it will have is that the money raised here is earmarked for another project. So indirectly, it will mean that the other project can be realized. But for this project and for the holders of the token bonds thus far, it doesn't have any implication. <coughs> so the process is there will be a, a primary market, as it is now, trying to reach the 3 million. If the issuer of the bond, being the developer, is happy with anything below, he can close the primary market and the secondary market will open where we peer to peer transactions will occur. And they will extract that money and use that in whatever development or new projects that they can. And also, what, 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 are, what disadvantages or issues are there with this? So, um, the disadvantages obviously is, uh, as, as, um, as I mentioned before, we are trying to democratize or open the investor space by um, well, 10x to what it is currently. But there are thresholds for investors to actually enter in and use wallets, for example, to go that investment route. That's a bit the challenge that we're seeing now as well. Um, who is our end customer in this sense? Like, who is buying these kind of tokens? They for sure have some kind of sustainability angle, but they would need to be somewhat crypto native, or at least decentralized finance native. And there they might expect like the next return, which has been historically. So that's that's a, one of the core thresholds or challenges that we're facing. The, the, what benefit do you get from building this gotcha. So we um, as a software provider just build the technology that you see here. So this is basically a white paper solution that the issue can design however he or she likes. And we charge the issuer the service fee. So the investors are not charged except for transaction fees <coughs> that are charged by the Ethereum blockchain. Have you trialed the option with potential users or no? So we have not. Uh, we have not trialed it. That was the question. Right. Um, no, we haven't. So we, we set so much focus on the technology and the regulatory boundaries. Uh, the first few years of developing the product, uh, we sort of didn't pay enough attention to, to trial runs because, yeah, I mean, the call to action here can be optimized, uh, UX, um, usability. So that's something that we're now hitting the ground running and trying to do as, as we go along. Um, and obviously, there is there is a soft education element and the conferences that we go to on the line to explain this. Yeah, maybe you covered this already. Just about the liquidity of the like, as as a bondholder, yeah. um, say after six months you want to sell it, are you able to? And then who goes on to buy it? Because I guess until you have a critical mass of users, that might be an issue. Excellent question. 
So the way we do it here is that the issuer sets the nominal value of the bond. Whatever is raised, he has to reserve 10% of that amount for a liquidity pool. And that liquidity pool we establish on a decentralized exchange, so Uniswap typically, where secondary market trading can be facilitated. But still, if let's say more than 10% of the value of tokens want to exit before six months, <coughs> that's going to be an issue. So there we will have this uh, critical mass threshold. <coughs> we need to incentivize the token holders also to provision to the liquidity pool. But it's it's a really interesting question, and maybe if, um, if I can go back to uh, one of the slides here. Uh, Not this guy, <laughs> but this one. Um, so you'll see here in the traditional finance world, you have um, finance liquidity providers. <clears throat> and liquidity provider in the traditional world is they do um, matchmaking on an exchange. On the decentralized exchange, actually, this benefit outsourced to the owners or whoever is holding the token. So although it might not be a very good argument because liquidity providers on Nexus haven't yielded a lot of return historically, but maybe for these green bonds it would be different. <clears throat> but we are saying and trying to incentivize the users, hey, if you have it, then put that amount also in the liquidity pool and earn a passive income on the transactions that are going on in the secondary market. And then to incentivize the, the rates in the liquidity pool that you get the time with the exactly. exactly right. Is there a liquidity pool right now for even this one, or is it too early? Uh, too early, so there is it's still in the primary market. Yeah. Obviously, some of the buyers, since it's permissionless on Uniswap, we should establish the, the secondary market already. Um, but we argue there is no benefit for the user to do that because the price in the primary market is set fixed. Uh, so there, there will be a nonsensical arbitrage. Yeah. How often are the Payments or uh, as a bondholder, how often do I get payments back? Excellent. So, the way we've structured the product here is uh, it's similar to a zero proof of bond. Yep. And the reason why it has been structured like that is the, I wouldn't say certain mean, but the issuer saves withholding tax on the SPD level. So, meaning it's actually income tax on the investor, and that will be determined wherever the investor sits. And that's more efficient to do so. So there is not a forced interest payment going out from the SPV, but an implied, how should I say, liquidity provision of 4% uh, the nominal value each year. And so <clears throat> is your company also like, structuring the bonds themselves, or is it just a platform? So we are we are definitely helping the SPV structure them because for example, this SPD in particular, it has 12 employees. Uh, they're by no means financially savvy people. And they are focusing on developing projects, so that's not their expertise. We, we do definitely help them or suggest how they can do it, but it's in their decisions eventually how to structure it. Um, yeah. How long would you expect it to take to fill um, to, to, to the bond? Oof, great question. I mean, if you look at the, the rate as it's been going now, it's been 75,000 a week. Uh, so then you can do the math. But uh, it has also been silent for, for a couple of days now. So we, we certainly don't know. And what we are actually trying to push for now is, is institutional partnerships because we think they need to be the interim bridge here. Uh, we don't have enough community engagement simply because we are the five techies, academics sitting in a room programming this stuff, and we're not salesmen. So we need to do a job there building the community. Um, and hopefully we are successful in the future. But, is, but is the, would an investment in this still be secure because it is a physical power plant? Um, so yes, it will still be secure in, in what sense do you mean? Unlike, if anything happens, if it doesn't bond is fulfilled or something, you, you wouldn't lose anything. So there isn't a guarantee covering the default of the, of the payment. Uh, so let's say the power plant blows up, which the risk of uh, doing that is minimal. But let's say that would occur. Uh, there will be a minimum course on whatever is left of collateral. Uh, and the senior debt holder, as is the token holders, will be the first one to start reclaiming any, any 
you haven't philosophized that. <coughs> yeah. Um, how do you go about um, doing due diligence on these projects? A great question. So we have uh, quite a lengthy list. It's also uh, described in the white paper uh, of requirements to issuers. The most important one that I would like to mention is probably the debt service coverage ratio. Uh, and since we focus on operational assets at the beginning, we can actually historically calculate the cash flow and determine whatever what is, what is the feasible uh, service level um, that, that we need to obtain. Okay, so was the Rwanda project already operational? Correct. Correct. Yes, that's right. So um, as you can see here, um, it's been live for two years, um, and the electricity production has been. Oh, Oh my goodness, uh, I've used Mac for too long. Um, here you can see the historic. So, for the last year, that's been the production. Uh, so, will your focus in the short term, medium term, be on operational projects before then looking at newly developed projects? Exactly right. Um, because we want to bring sort of collateralized, stable yield to decentralized finance because we believe there is a huge demand for it. And then you top it off with the ESP stuff, and uh, we believe it's very strong. It's, it's a great product. Yep. Do you envisage like um, uh, profiling bonds on here that are like blended, so DeFi and non-DeFi? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Um, and there is still a bit of a hurdle there because let's say someone wants to pay with fiat money. That person most likely doesn't have a wallet, and we need somewhere to deposit the tokens because we don't host them out of regulatory uh, requirements or, or thresholds. So there we would probably need to partner with some third party providers that can hold them for for the okay. um, What do you think like the balance should be between trying to start? New startups and you know, to build some sustainability, and then also encouraging all the you know, ways to be sustainable. So the, that, the question was the balance between being innovative as a startup yeah. and, and the traditional, and trying to merge the two. Yeah, as they would need to live in parallel. Did I get that right? Yeah, or not quite. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Um. So there is definitely a transition period here. There is not going to be like one. Transition in a, in a mass here going from traditional finance to DeFi for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why our business model in the beginning is going to be more B2B focused. So, trying to partner with traditional institutions mm -hmm. that have an ESG mandate and an inclination towards digital assets. And there, there is a massive transition, right? I mean, big players like BlackRock, Schroeder's, Fidelity, they're all on this track uh, to, to do so. Um, so yeah, for sure, we, we that's our core focus. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question or even. Um, uh, and also, like about sustainability, because I guess this is quite focused on sustainability, but for sure. other investments, let's say stuff are. And I mean, like as an overall picture, do you think it's worth putting more energy into creating these or trying to encourage the bigger ones to focus more on sustainability? Uh, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer, but I think definitely we need the bottom-up approach in order for it to change um, and not trying to build, let's say, on, um, on the more aggregated system. I, I don't see the benefit in that. You need to really tackle the root cause and start bottom-up solving the problems. Um, and, and that goes back to the answer before that. We can basically serve as the origination and being a back end system for the bottom up integration. And mm. uh, that also promotes sustainability in terms of, well, avoid greenwashing and really make sure that the data and the financial flows goes to sustainable projects and not somewhere else. Yeah. Is there any like project areas outside of energy that you guys are thinking of? Yeah, for sure. Um, and sure. what could they be? Yeah, a uh, great question. So we are, um, there is also a supplier that is very interested in what we do that is doing carbon capture. Um, there is also another one doing more waste to energy related stuff. Um, even sustainable housing uh, has, been, has been asked for. But it's, it's all this chicken and the egg situation. So we need to really showcase this yes. product that, that there is actually a good product. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so, in, in the case of the, the bond with the hydro plant, um, so if, if the company that, that has taken out the bond like, defaults on that, then how does like the collateral really work there? Because then surely they're no longer like operating the hydro plant, and then doesn't that then lose its value? So, how is that kind of providing collateral? Um, so there will be an off-chain recourse for whatever collateral that is that is left. That will be somewhat also our or a responsibility that we would like to take. Um, <coughs> you realize that well, power plant isn't operational, but there is still a liability issue here that, that needs to be taken and uh, accountability for. The way it's regulated in the agreement is it needs to be settled in the courts of Switzerland where the issuance is happening. And whether or not it's actually being fulfilled, well, you could say that in the traditional finance world as well. It, it will be the same recourse process. Um, you know. And is it meaning in any case, if the developer doesn't really showcase his willingness to do so, well, then the community is gone. So there is no vested interest for the developer to actually just take the money and, and go off because he or she needs to develop new projects. That's basically their business model. So essentially, the, to the token holder is treated the same exactly as a normal bond holder, right? Exactly. Is it one for one? Exactly right. I mean, off, -air, off course, uh, reclaimment, uh, off chain reclaimment or recurse, that's <coughs> exactly the same as, as, as a normal senior bond holder. Yeah. Are you focusing on projects in the emerging markets? Is that where your main focus is, or are you going to all geographies? We are geographically agnostic, but we definitely see that emerging markets has the largest potential uh, for this technology to actually deliver real uh, impact. Um, and that's why we started also with Rwanda. Um, and also the community down there seems to be very inclined to use actually cryptocurrencies to facilitate transfers. And, and also from a more maybe philosophical viewpoint, it's actually a very sensible store of value for people locally. I mean, <clears throat> local currency is unstable, the local financial system is unstable. Holding a token to a project that lives in your backyard might actually be a, a very attractive offering. Um, and 4% might look very, very good. Uh, however, for international investors, they tend to price emerging markets risk too high. So this community thought then an accessibility to locals should then uh, have a, a lower risk. So can I ask another question? Um, can I can you talk a bit more about the makeup of your team? Sure. I'm just interested to know the expertise. That's yeah, sure. We have actually one team member in the back of the room here. That's Jack. Um, he's our product uh, officer. Uh, we have uh, uh, three more technical guys. So one CTO with 20 years of experience in DevOps. Uh, we have a blockchain engineer um, doing the program in all the smart contracts. We have a front end dev, uh, full stack IT architect that is doing uh, whatever you see on screen together with the designer. And then there's myself um, as more sort of private equity, traditional finance um, expert. And then we have uh, quite a large academic and industrial advisory board consisting of around nine people. Uh, so two professors and then seven from C-suite finance industry, uh, as well as climate tech, fintech uh, area. So still very lean team, and we would like to keep it like that, but um, not try to accumulate too much cost. Uh, but we hope that once we scale, also we can we can build it. Yeah. Right. I think the organizers went out. So uh, if there aren't any questions left, then thank you so much for your attention. And the questions? Um.